Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, what I'm going to talk about isn't completely new, so the preprint is from last year, and you know, um, it introduced um, a new symplectic invariant, uh, which can distinguish closed symplectic manifolds, uh, which other invariants cannot distinguish. Uh, you know, this was a, I was quite proud of it, but uh, I don't think it's had much of a reaction. In fact, I, I know several graveyards which have more activity. Um, so I'm just going to talk about it again. Uh, so, um, well, one reason why maybe it's, you know, it hasn't had really a lot of popularity is because the formal definition is, is quite complicated. It comes from the fact that, you know, this is a new development and, and um, you know, it's still in sort of unfinished form. So instead of giving the formal definition, I'll explain to you the various ingredients that enter into the definition. Okay? Um, so, so first of all, you know, what is the question that, that I asked myself, right? So, um, so take, suppose I have a symplectic manifold. Um, does this guy here, H1 of M, let's say with real coefficients, play an essentially different role in its symplectic topology? Than the higher odd cohomology groups okay that's a question now the obvious answer would be of course it plays an entirely different role because closed one forms Uh, dual to symplectic vector fields. Okay? And in particular, closed one forms up to exact ones are uh, dual to symplectic vector fields, modular Hamiltonian ones, and you know, a lot of the fundamental dynamics comes from just looking at this. Well, the other answer is no. Um, If you look from a point of view of Chrome of Witten theory and what makes the manifold run, um, is, is its quantum cohomology, which is because additively, it's the same thing as ordinary cohomology in some field. Um, but but you know, if you want to, the product doesn't respect the classical gradings. So Okay? So from a point of view of quantum cohomology, really intrinsically, it doesn't seem to there is a difference between an H1 class and an H3 class, because here the grading gets reduced to Z mod 2. So the quantum cohomology wouldn't actually be able to tell. Um, <clears throat> now, I think that both these answers are right. Um, so so you know, th there is something that's special about H1 classes. So which means that you take, take the, say, the small quantum product with an H1 classes um, is undeformed, so it doesn't contain any contributions other than, other than the classical cup product. So, so H1 has a, maintains a direct relation with the standard geometry. Okay? So if you ask me what I think about this question, I would say, well, on a formally speaking, you should be able to treat them all the same. However, if you use the class of degree one, you expect to see a direct relationship with geometry that you don't see anymore in higher degrees. Or at least it's not as, you know, Still a relationship, but it's not as direct. 
So, okay. So, now, um, so l let me explain to you this um, you know, class, recall this classical notion of flux, and you know, this, so this is entirely, this section will be entirely about H1 and about classical geometry, and, and really nothing here is, is in any way new. Okay? So, so I recall to you the, the, the notion of flux, so we fix a, I fix a class in H1 MR and take alpha T closed one forms such that if I take the total, the cohomology class and I integrate it up, I get the same thing as alpha. For instance, you could take alpha T to be independent of T, but that's not necessary. So, so then the alpha T are dual to symplectic vector fields. Xt, which generate an isotopy. Phi t. So you start at the identity and you end up at some phi. Okay? And phi is independent of the choice of whichever representatives you pick up to Hamiltonian isotopy. Okay. And the way that one thing that people do is to define a subgroup of H1, which is the group of all classes such that one can choose the alpha t so that phi 1 is the identity. Okay? Or in other words, it's the same thing as saying no matter how you choose them, uh, phi is um, is Hamiltonian as a topic to the identity. Okay, so this is a subgroup. It's called the flux subgroup. And and it's a discrete subgroup. That's that's Ono, proved by Ono in general, followed partial results by several people. Okay? So if you like, the flux subgroup is a, you can think of it as an invariant of a symplectic manifold. Okay? Now, when you actually want to work with this invariant, if you want to prove that something does lie in the flux subgroup, well, that's elementary. It depends on your imagination. You have to figure out how to choose the alpha t, such that you wander around this isotope and you come back to the identity. Okay? So, um, uh, so the question is, how do you prove that a class does not lie in the flux subgroup? Okay? So... So for any, any symplectic automorphism, we have Fleur cohomology, and that's invariant on the Hamiltonian isotopy. So if alpha is in the flux subgroup, then this would just be the Fleur homology of the identity, which is quantum cohomology. And otherwise, it typically isn't. Um, so, and also, same thing, if you have a Lagrangian submanifold, Could take two Lagrangian submanifolds. Then you could look look at this guy here, and this would be isomorphic to this guy here. Well, you know, in so far as this one here is defined. Plenty of examples of Lagrangian submanifolds, you can't define this at all. Or if you can define it um, and it requires additional, it's not exactly unique, it requires additional choices beyond just the choice of Lagrangian, then of course this isomorphism will only be true if the choices have been carefully coordinated, which makes it a lot less useless, useful. But, but the upshot of this thing here is that 
this is useful to prove. So these are implications, but these guys here are not too hard to compute in, in many cases. So this is useful as a converse to prove that, that certain classes are not in the flux subgroup. So, um, so let me give you an example. Okay, so one of my usual examples. So, so we take a, a smooth cortex, smooth hypersurface of degree four, um, with. Um, Omega k, the um, Fabini study form. Okay. So, so there are plenty of examples of um, symplectomorphisms psi. such that this is not this is not as a topic to the identity as a symplectomorphism but it is as a topic to the identity in in diffeomorphism, and in fact, becomes symplectically isotopic to the identity. If I perturb this class. Generically. Okay. Sorry. What does this mean here? You know, because this assumption, of course, psi acts uh, trivially on uh, on cohomology. So by Hofer's theorem, if I take a small perturbation of my symplectic form, I can find uh, you know a small perturbation of my uh, of my diffeomorphism, which is symplectic for the new form. And these small perturbations are all symplectically isotopic to the identity. Um, in their own symplectic automorphism group, perturbed symplectic. So this fact that these things are non-trivial is sort of highly unstable in the perturbations of the symplectic form. And there are plenty and plenty and plenty of examples. And um, of course, again, this part here, isotopic to the identity, is elementary. How do you get a hold of the other statement here? Um, well, it's distinguished. by either this guy here or by looking at these kinds of things here. OK? Uh, this is pretty few. Even this one here, which gives you a little bit more choice, you can choose any L0, L1, is, is pretty feasible in this case here because it, it's, it's strictly well defined. Uh, in the case where, let's say, L0 and L1 are spheres. This is a symplectic four manifold, right? OK, so now you say, well, what, what, what does this have to do with what I just told you about? Um, you know, because the, 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 the quartic surface is simply connected. It has no H1. So there's no flux or anything like that. But you know, all I'm going to do is I'm going to transform this problem from discrete dynamics into a problem of continuous dynamics by the standard device of passing to the symplectic mapping torus. OK? so. So this is m equals r2 cross k divided by in one direction it's periodic, and in the other direction, oops, you put in this discrete symplectic. So, and, and the symplectic form here. Okay, 
So if I make a picture of this guy here, um, so it has fiber k, and it fibers over the torus, and in one direction, parallel transpose the identity, and in the other direction, the monodrum is psi. It's a locally trivial symplectic vibration. Okay, and so, so m is diffeomorphic and indeed uh, symplectically deformation equivalent to, to the mapping torus of the trivial thing, okay, which is T2 cross K, but It's easy to find examples where M is not symplectically isomorphic. Okay. And, and how is it distinguished? In fact, you know, um, well, you know, you construct a whole bunch of, of, of source examples which you know are distinguished by some flow homology things, and I, I don't actually know a single one where you fail to, to arrive to the desired conclusion. In, in those examples, what happens is that um, the flux group of M is not equal to integer cohomology. Okay, so now if I took T2 cross K, the flux group of that is actually equal to the integral, integral lattice in cohomology because it's, it just basically comes from the flux group of the two torus where, you know, if you take a DS form, you sort of flow in this direction here and you come back to yourself. After some time, you take DT, you flow in that direction. You come back. Okay, so but, um, so, so concretely, If I take alpha equal ds, then, you know, and you take the obvious choice of the alpha t, so, so this one form is ds, so you flow in d by dt direction, so then um, after time one, you get to here, okay? So you're flowing around the direction where you have non-trivial, uh, oops, you have non-trivial monodromy, so every fiber will get mapped to itself by psi, okay? And, um, in particular, if you look at this guy here, the fixed point flow homology of this gentleman here, you know, it seems geometrically intuitive, the fixed points of this, well, are you know, one fixed point here smeared out over the whole torus. You have to think a little bit because there is monodromy, but it actually turns out to be the case that it is the cohomology of the torus tends uh, the fixed point flow homology of psi. Okay, so in particular, if you can use that one here to distinguish the original psi from the identity, then you stand a very good chance, mod algebraic complications, to distinguish uh, phi, phi from the, prove that phi is not Hamiltonian isotopic to the identity by using this guy here, and that will prove that that class there was not in the flux group. Okay, so similarly, or um, given what? Given a Lagrangian submanifold, Lagrangian submanifolds in K, and everything being nice. Uh, associated Lagrangian submanifolds S1, so 
So phi dot over n s1 in T2 with trivial monodromy. So you can just put it in the fiber and move it along a loop. And then if you consider this guy here, that is just the cohomology of S1, tensor the flow cohomology of phi of L0, L1. OK? So if that is a psi. So if, this is the, if these are the groups that you use to distinguish psi from the identity originally in the fiber, then there's a good chance that you can use the same groups um, to distinguish, um, to, to prove that this guy here is not Hamiltonian as a topic to the identity. And in fact, this guy here is actually slightly more trivial than that one here. Actually, it's sort of evident because all the intersections lie over a circle in the T2. So you could just say I lift up to my universal cover, to, to, well, to an infinite cyclic cover. And then things, it, it would be obvious what's going on. OK. Yeah. And again, what, what's happening here is you know, we put the Lagrangian over this circle here, which is trivial. Then this flow that we've defined moves it along here, and you come back to yourself. But of course, everything has to be has psi applied to it. OK, questions? OK. Um, Okay, so these are, um, this is obviously not what I want to talk about, really. So, um, you know, so in this case here, we, we got a bunch of symplectic manifolds, and they were, um, you know, actually symplectically deformation equivalent to T2 cross K. So they wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to distinguish them from T2 cross K by, let's say, Gromov Witten invariants, which are, however, anyway, essentially trivial. Um, um, and, but we managed to distinguish them from T2 cross K by, by looking at the flux, which is some sort of exceptional thing that you can associate to an H1 class. Okay? Now, let me uh, make it impossible for you to actually use H1. Okay? So take some symplectic manifold N with, with the dimension of N much bigger than the dimension of M and embed m into n symplectically. And you know, if the dimension is really high, um, you can say, well, how could I do this? I constructed these strange manifolds n. But um, if the dimension is sufficiently high, is you have h principles apply and blow up m to form b. OK, so it's called B, is the blow up, so it's kind of symplectic blow up. And, um, you know, let me make, suppose that this thing here is simply connected. Um, no big deal. So then, now this blow up here has H1 equals to 0, um, but H3 of the blow up is isomorphic to H1 of your original manifold, OK? So as you should think, uh, do a blow up, roughly speaking, you, you, you get a copy of the cohomology of the original manifold that gets added um, to, oh, I'm sorry, it's H3 of n, which I'm not interested in, plus H1 of m, OK? So, so my question is how to distinguish these manifolds b? Okay? And now you see that you know, the question that I originally gave for motivation, which seems maybe a little bit bizarre, is now important for what you're going to guess what's going on here. Because you lost the H1. What was before the H1 now lies in degree 3. So if you believe that there's a special role for H1 in higher dimensional cohomology classes, show no such phenomena, and have no similar structure, then I think you should conclude that maybe these things are all the same. Yeah? After all, you know, 
On the other hand, if you believe that all odd dimensional cohomology classes um, should somehow be thought of in the, same, in the same way, maybe a little bit more abstract, but in principle, then you should probably believe that you know, we can apply this thing here, uh, use these H3 classes, um, these ones here, to get back the previous information that we previously got using flux. Um, and again, if you think about it naively, that, that sounds like a preposterous thing to say, because certainly if you have a three form, there is no way that you can flow along it. But you know, we're not proposing to do this in a direct geometric way, uh, but somehow abstractly. Okay. <laughs> so the answer is that indeed, you can use, in this particular class of examples at least, you can define invariants that are based on H3 and based on formally flowing Lagrangian submanifolds in H3 directions, and that these classes actually prove that these blow-ups, at least in one example, are not symplectically isomorphic. Okay. And this is the new invariant. So, and uh, by the way, so you can, you know, you have to follow through the H principle a little bit, and uh, you, know, you will see that you know, the, the examples of these high dimensional manifolds that you can construct are, of course, diffeomorphic, but they're also symplectically deformation equivalent. So they certainly not, cannot be distinguished by anything um, like Gromov Witten theory. Um, I think the, the obvious question is maybe you know, there are certain small refinements of Gromov Witten theory where modular spaces are considered to be as Bordism classes or something. Can those distinguish them? Well, I would say the answer is pretty clearly no, but, but you can't be sure because these refinements are defined only in, under certain assumptions, which probably don't even apply here. So you would have to say first what you mean uh, before, before one can discuss this question. But I, I believe that these phenomena are sort of genuinely deeper and reflect sort of internal geometry of the symplectic manifold that, that gromov witten invariants just can't really see. OK. Right. Happiness so far? OK, so what I'm going to do now is um, I want to address one obvious question that comes from this construction here, um, which is, uh, you know, how, um, how would I ever be able to, um, to say something about um, the symplectic topology of a manifold as complicated as this blow up here? Right? I mean, this does not just have, um, you know, the blow up doesn't just have n, but it has the whole thing of n, which I didn't quite say what I was going to choose, but which has its own rich geometry. Now, luckily, it happens that when you think sufficiently abstractly, those two pieces actually separate themselves out. Okay? And I'm going to explain this um, so in, a, in a sort of toy model example. Okay? Where my the thing that, so n is itself a K3 surface, let's say. You could take a four torus if you don't like. That was also a K3 surface, um, or T4. And, and m is a point, and so b is still the blower. OK? So what I want to say is I want to look at the uh, quantum cohomology of this gentleman here. And my aim is to show how um, the geometry of, you know, how essentially you see a piece in the symplectic geometry of the blow-up that just um, reflects the, the geometry of the blow-up locus, which in this case here is a point. Okay? And that's something that wouldn't happen in classical geometry. So, so let me write down what the quantum cohomology of this blow-up is. And of course, additively, it's you know, the same thing as classical cohomology. So you have this c the cohomology of this K3 surface. And, so, um, and you add, in this case, one generator, which corresponds to the um, exceptional divisor. And at this point, I need to disclose my choice of coefficients here. So this is, this is some Novikov field field in one variable q. 
OK, and so the, the quantum product here has, you know, the reason why I chose, I said, take a K3 or a four torus is because those things, uh, you know, generically don't contain any rational curves. So essentially, everything that you do when you compute quantum cohomology is just based on the, the only rational curve you have, which is the one that, that, that covers E. And so you have the classical product, so it's minus a point. And then you have um, the contribution from the quantum product, which is this gentleman here. Yeah? Q to the, the symplectic area, I guess I should say, omega sub b of e. OK? And you know, of course, there's much artistry to making, actually making symplectic blow-ups. But in this case here, I will assume that this area is made small. So it's like a, a silly blow-up with a small area. OK? So, so you'll notice that when you do this, three times, well, there's no curves going through a generic point. So OK? So that means that this quantum, this small quantum product with E has two eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues of quantum multiplication, this is a this endomorphism here are, are 0 and lambda, which is this guy here, <coughs> q to the omega b of e. OK? So now this, this, um, this, quanti this uh, quantum product with even elements is, uh, you know, is a commutative ring. So you can think of all the quantum multiplications as commuting operators. So if one of them has two eigenvalues, all the others have to um, respect that splitting into the two eigenvalues, which means that the ring itself splits into a direct sum of two pieces. Okay? So, um, And for the one associated to the non-trivial eigenvalue, um, so each piece has, uh, is generated by an idempotent. And this was the moment for which I needed my notes. So this is this idempotent here. Um, is the generating idempotent. In fact, that piece here is just one dimensional. And I want to think of this dimension here as being the quantum cohomology of a point. OK? All right. But this is just, you can say, well, this is some kind of quantum cohomology computations. How much can they possibly teach me, right? So I want to show that the, the internal geometry of the symplectic manifold um, you know, shows sign of this splitting. Okay? So now I need to you know, bring in some bigger hammers. So So we have the Foucault category, which has, uh, you know, its objects are Lagrangian submanifolds. And uh, morphisms involve flow cohomology, and so on and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, you can say to me, well, it is clearly preposterous that you claim to understand this guy here because that would imply a sort of complete classification of Lagrangian submanifolds. In fact, I sort of don't, even so we're not that far away from it. But um, I want to make a, a formal enlargement. Um, so the, the so-called category of perfect modules 
it sort of closes it up under certain operations, which are purely algebraic. And um, let me call it perf. Okay. I can't enter into the reasons here, but this guy here is computable fairly easily. Now, I'm not interested in the whole thing. Okay. So what happens is, well, excuse me. I'm, I missed out an important piece of information. Okay. So there are actually different guys here, one for each parameter value t, and t is in k. Um, so these usual elements of k are these power series in q, so a r q to the r. And this guy here is only defined, um, you know, it's defined for all points here which have uh, only posit strictly positive powers of q. Okay? So this is sort of there's a category for each of these things, and you know, depends, it depends which Lagrangians you want to put in. Um, I maybe should have not said this, but, but it would make the statement incorrect. Okay? So now there's one more thing that you can say about these categories, which you want. I'll write it down, and then I'll explain what the meaning of it is. Okay, this guy here, this is the Hochschild cohomology. And I could replace this guy here by the formal enlargement. It doesn't actually make a difference. So there's a map of rings here. And this guy here is, you know, it's a little bit like the center of the category. So in particular, if you have a splitting of this guy here into two pieces, that induces a splitting of this category here into two pieces. So every object will be formally divided as into a direct sum of two pieces. Okay? And now I wanted to claim this, write down this thing here, and then I'll explain what the geometry is. So you take the Fokaya category of this guy here, and for reasons that I'll explain in a second, the value of t that I want is minus lambda. And, and then I apply p, which means I consider the the direct sum and induced by p. So this is equivalent to, well, say the Fukai category of a point at the level of perf. Okay, so once you pass through these perf enlargements here, this guy here is the same thing as the category of a point. So this is what I mean here. You take the geometry here, you go through some horrible formal things, and you split off a direct summand, which is exactly the thing that you expected to the point. So you, you find the, the the blow up locus in this. Okay, now let me explain the geometry between, behind this thing here, which is actually not that hard. And I should say that this is essentially due, this is essentially this whole thing that I'm explaining here is due to Ivan Smith. Um, so, what's actually going on here? So you make a local picture in, in sort of toric coordinates. So this was your original, these were your two original coordinates on your symplectic four manifold. You blew up a point. The toric picture looks like this. Okay. So the size of this thing here is essentially omega of e and omega of e. And this is a this is the basis of a of a torus vibration. So every fiber, so this there's a particular the point here, omega of e, omega of e corresponds to a Lagrangian torus T, OK? And moreover, this torus you know, you can see that there are holomorphic disks. Uh, so, so this torus, uh, there's nothing mysterious going on here, right? So you, you just start with a local picture of your four-manifold near a point. You have your torus, which is just a Clifford torus. 
So the Clifford torus has two families of holomorphic disks bounding it, one way and the other day, which are Maslow index two disks. But there's also there's a family of Maslow index four disks, which are sort of diagonal ones, and they go through the origin, and they will become Maslow index two after you blow up. Okay, so there are three families of Maslow index two disks. boundary on T and and the boundary homology classes of these disks are 1 0 0 1 and 1 1 and they all have the same area, which is exactly omega of E. So you know, to figure out whether the flow homology of such a guy is non-trivial, um, there's a convenient formalism, uh, which um, you know, was introduced by O and Cho and uh, many other people, uh, which is to write down a, a function of two variables, so-called superpotential, which just it has one monomial for each disk, and then in front of it you have this guy here, q to the omega of e. So in this case here, the monomials are z1 plus z2 plus z1, z2. And in order to figure out whether the flow homology is non-zero, you should see where this thing here has critical points. So in this here, the critical there's a critical point at z1, z2 equals minus 1, minus 1, and that's the unique one. Um, so this means that if you equip this guy here with a particular spin structure, the flow homology will be non-trivial. And I also want to note that W of minus 1 minus 1 is equal to um, minus Q to the omega of E, which is minus lambda. OK? So this means. So this means, this is what you want to know. It will tell you which, part, which Foucault category this lies in. So this means that T is an object of the Foucault category of B for this particular value here, minus lambda. And in fact, It lies in the image singled out by this projector. To do that, I would have to look at this map here as far as that particular object is concerned, which I'm not going to do. Um, so we have one object of this guy here. And it's worthwhile looking at what the endomorphisms of these objects are, which are the Fleur homology. And the, so the way that you compute Fleur homology in this formalism here um, is um, you look at the, at the Hessian of this function here at the critical point, and um, in particular, if the Hessian, if the critical point is non-degenerate, which is here, then the flow homology is actually a Clifford algebra. So it's a Clifford algebra. For a non-degenerate quadratic form in, in, in two variables. And uh, um, so, so, so what does this mean here? So the Clifford algebra has an idempotent in it. Um, and so formally, once you introduce this perf thing, so part of this perf thing is to, to allow you to introduce formal direct summons of objects. Um, this torus here is isomorphic to some mysterious object plus the same object with the orientation reversed. and and X generates the category. So um, in this case here, so not only, so that's the object that actually corresponds to the point Lagrangian on the point. It's not exactly the torus, but 
a direct summon of the torus. And th the main work, which in this case here is fairly easy, is to show that you know, in some sense there are no other objects than the ones that this thing here gives rise to. Um, in this case, it's fairly easy. In general, um, it uses some technology uh, due to Abu Zaid and Fukaya, U Uta, and Ono. OK, so but what I wanted to convince you is that at least in certain cases, if you blow up, well, you can't understand the whole symplectic geometry of the blown up manifold, but you'll be able to identify a piece which corresponds to the stuff that you blew up. And that piece is somehow intrinsically characterized. So you can find the information that uh, where you got from. OK, so I still haven't answered the main question which is, you know, that's very nice. You, you, know, you took these things, you blow them up. Um, but how do you recover what you originally did um, using flux, right? So you no longer have the possibility of just flowing things. What you have is you have uh, the same situation as before on some abstract algebraic level. So you need to learn how to take objects of categories and flow them along vector fields. Um, so this is the last part of the talk. And you know, at some point, I had to give a colloquium talk. So um, I decided to invent a catchy title for this subject, which comes up not just here, but in various other branches of mathematics. And I decided to call it categorical dynamics. Okay? And now, if you're a geometer, your hair will stand on end, but you know, it can't be helped. OK, so suppose that A is a, is a differential graded category or an A infinity category. Basically, think of the Fukai category over an algebraically closed field, closed field K of characteristic 0. Now, you might observe that before that, we didn't have just any algebraically closed field K of characteristic 0, but we had, um, we had a specific one, namely the Novikov field, which has a certain, certain topological aspects, namely aspects of non-Archimedean geometry. And I wish I could use that. It would be a, life a lot easier, but there are foundational issues which I'm unable to address. So I'm just going to work in a general algebra geometric setting. So, so we have perf A. This sort of formal enlargement, convenient category of perfect modules. It gives you a little bit more space. Um, I also have this guy here, the Horschel cohomology. And I want to look at, so, in, so let's say, this is Z2 graded because that's the situation that I'll encounter. So this is also Z2 graded. I want to look at the odd part. So the odd, and one thing that you get is for this guy here, um, you get every class in here gives you an endomorphism for any object of the category itself or, in fact, for any object of this formal enlargement here. Okay? Now, these things here, so if this were algebraic geometry and this guy here was a holomorphic vector bundle, that would be x1 of that vector bundle to itself, which characterizes first order deformations. And that's the same thing here true here. So these are the first, these are first order deformations of the object m. So what I want to say is I want to think of these guys here as non-commutative vector fields. Okay. And of the image here as a vector field on the moduli space of objects. Okay, that's a common philosophy to say, well, if you have a non-commutative object associated to some category, you have objects and you have a, a family of objects that should induce a commutative an ordinary vector field, which allows you to sort of infinitesimally deform objects. Okay? So this is, um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to um, make actual rigorous sense of this modular space of objects. You can try, but it comes out to be a pretty ugly guy by my standards. Okay? 
But my question is pretty simple, and I, I really take this, this name of this field reasonably seriously. You know, what we want to do with vector fields is we want to integrate them. You don't, don't just want to stare at the vector field, okay? Now, when you integrate a vector field, there are two issues. Well, in this case here, one, actually a third issue, which is pretty crucial, but the first issue is, is existence, right? So you have a vector field, can you integrate it, right? And here you immediately realize, that was the, the, the third crucial issue, that the framework I've built here is actually not great because I'm working in, in essentially in an algebra geometric thing or an algebraically closed field. Even if you had a polynomial vector field, of course the flow that it generates is by no means algebraic. Okay? So in some sense I failed before I even started. But I could say, okay, maybe not the whole flow is algebraic, but um, there might be algebraic orbits. Like periodic orbits are somehow closed, they come back to themselves. Um, so, 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 you know, even then existence is a very murky thing. Now, the thing that's reasonably easy to do classically is uniqueness, right? So if I have start with an object, I point you in a direction, I flow, do you get to some other object? And, you know, there it turns out that actually the answer is essentially yes. Um, and so the use that you make of this is to use this formalism here to imitate, you know, moving a Lagrangian submanifold by a non-Hamiltonian flow. So for the Fukaya category, this guy here comes with classes from quantum cohomology. So you can take an odd quantum class, you get an element in HH1, and that will give you for every Lagrangian submanifold some formal direction which is the analog, abstract analog, of actually flowing this thing along the class in H1, okay? But of course, you know, you can take classes that are of higher degree, odd classes. Okay, so the last thing I want to say is roughly what it looks like when you try to prove a uniqueness theorem here, okay? So for an algebraic orbit, So what, what is my orbit going to be? So my orbit is going to be, so take a smooth connected algebraic curve. See, I secretly think of it as an elliptic curve. doesn't have to be, but if it's, uh, but You know, the advantage of elliptic curves is that they have such a canonical regular one forms up to multiples, but let me choose a, a regular one form, sorry. Okay, this is just now algebraic geometry. It's a one form, so, so we can define the notion of families of perfect modules. parameterized by C. Okay, so for every, you have an object for every point of C, so these form, so they form a category I call perf of A over C. So if C was a point, that would be just a formal enlargement, otherwise there are some kind of families. Okay, so, so each such family um, let's call it uh, P, comes with a map, a map of algebraic vector bundles. So this is a family, so you can say, well, um, you know, usually the homes from a thing to itself would just be a vector space, but in this case here, um, this guy here, whoopsie. Sorry, since this is being videotaped, I should say that this, this thing here is also proper, which means that it has finite dimensional cohomology on the morphism spaces. So, so for every point of the curve C, you get a vector space, and these vector spaces actually form a coherent sheaf over C, and it comes with a map, so which means for every tangent vector on C, it, you get an, an endomorphism of degree one, which describes how the objects vary in that particular direction. 
Okay? So if this is zero, then that means as far as deformation theory is concerned, these objects are the same over all the fibers. They're the constant family. Okay? So, and now I can say what we mean by an orbit. So you fix some class in HH1, and we say that P follows that class if star is equal what? Well, this is a map from here to here, so one way that I could make it is by taking my this guy here, tensor the image of alpha. The image of alpha under this kind of map here, taken or well, the map from, sorry, huh? this kind of map here taken fiber-wise. Let's we call this map. cross, under cross. Okay. So this is what it means: is you have a family of objects over C, and if I ask you how do the objects vary in some direction, where well, they vary with a certain speed that's given by beta, but they always go in the direction that's indicated by alpha. Okay. And then there's a lemma, which says that families that follow alpha are determined. So up to a notion slightly weaker than isomorphism couldn't quite get isomorphism, weaker than isomorphism. By the value px0 at any single closed point. There you go. So if you know what your object looks like at one point, and it follows this thing here, then you know, if you have two families, they follow it. They're this isomorphic at one point, then up to some slightly weaker notion, they're isomorphic everywhere. And that defines my notion of orbit, right? I take my object, I say, you know, I call the object, you know, say that there's a, it's periodic over this curve C if I can find a family like this. Now, existence, there's no existence there. Mostly there wouldn't be one. But if it is, there's unique. It's unique, so you can use that to distinguish, uh, you know, you can use the, the, the dynamics of this behavior on the category to, um, you know, to produce invariance. And that's exactly the abstract analog of flux that I was referring to. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much.